table as we'd like to get underway. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Stabak. I'm the publisher of uh, now it is Asia Pacific Banking and Finance magazine and the managing director of Australian Financial Publications. And if I and Sonia look a little bit tired, it is because we are. This is the 59th event that we've delivered in 2012 and the second last of the Randstad Leaders Lectures series. And it is marvellous to be up here in a beautiful Brisbane uh, uh, afternoon at this time of year, late November. It's certainly steamy. I know it's going to be a very hot week uh, later on this week. And isn't that a good thing about Brisbane at this time of year? It gives me great pleasure to welcome so many of you here. Uh, and uh, at, at this time of year. What I'm going to do is introduce you to our sponsors and our hosts, and then um, Bob Morton, who's the general manager for IBM, will introduce you to David Foster. David's going to talk, he tells me, for about 25 minutes or so, maybe 20, and then uh, take a few questions from the floor. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. I've got half a dozen myself, but I don't want to hog the floor. And then um, Berkeley Cox from uh, Kingwood Mallison will be we cheering off with his uh, thanks as the host. So first of all, I'm going to introduce you to our, um, our series host, Randstad. Randstad have been a great supporter of, uh, of ABNF and this Leaders Lectures now for three years. And Mike Roddy is the Regional Manager for Client Solutions for Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia, which means that he has got a lot of frequent flyer points. He spends a bit of time on a plane. So Mike, I'm going to hand over to you for your welcome. Mike Roddy, everyone, please put your hands together. Thank you, Andrew. And, uh uh, it's nice to be uh, speaking to you all from Queensland, uh, the uh, capital of Australia. And, uh, and, uh, and I've been lobbying, Andrew, we all have been for quite some time for, uh, to host an ABF uh, series here uh, in Brisbane and uh, in other parts of, the, of Queensland. Do you know, competing with the big banks and what can a competitor do to, uh, to level the playing field when the field is not even? There's one thing certain. Uh, there's considerable volatility out there. And uh, from Randstad's point of view, we're delighted to be associated with ABNF. Uh, in 2010, we were a sponsor. In 2011, we sponsored the, the lecture series, which we're delighted to and very proud to be associated. And it gives us an opportunity to work with a lot of the leading uh, players, if you like, in the banking and finance industry. In fact, in most of the organisations across Australia, and one thing is quite obvious that um, you know, our mission, uh, for those who know us, literally is shaping the world of work uh, and working in partnership with a lot of our clients and some of you here tonight, uh, because one of the things that's critical is business prosperity, productivity. The war for talent never went away uh, and essentially uh, eliminating risk by ensuring you attract the right people is something we are supporting a lot of our clients in distinguishing their brand in the marketplace. I said a couple of weeks ago that uh, we payroll uh, across the globe just over a half a million people uh, and, uh, and a great deal of them. I tried to get a percentage and I, I did that about nearly 10% of them are in the finance industry. Uh, so when you have that much uh, traction, if you like, and employees in the marketplace that are directly payrolled by us and working in the industry, you kind of get a good feel for what works and what are the things that one can do to distinguish ourselves. Interestingly, over the last few weeks, we've been having an interesting set of discussions with a lot of HR directors, uh, CEOs, etc., looking at the things that uh, keep them awake at night. Uh, things like everything from talent acquisition through to ensuring that there's uh, some gender balance, how to tackle diversity, how to be innovative, how to distinguish your brand. And they're the things that we're looking forward to talking with you all and sharing some insights. So we'd be delighted to... to uh, to assist, share some information. We've got considerable information uh, in regards to on thought leadership on our website. But also, before you go tonight, just one quick plug. Rand says, Shaping the World of Work report and what the future and what the trends are. If you can grab a copy of it, uh, literally, I know that the uh, accountability is with the HR team, but each one of us are responsible for ensuring that we have this as part of our agenda to get the right people and, and what are the best way to ensure we have a culture of productivity and performance and retention. So delighted and looking forward to hearing David speak. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to you all and enjoy your evening. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mike. And I can honestly say, as I've read uh, a lot of this report, we've presented uh, HR luncheons around the region uh, over the last 12 months or so, that there really, really is a science to what goes on in, in uh, putting this report together. It is a step up from what uh, you would normally read in this space. So I do recommend it. Now, I'm going to introduce you now to Bob Morton, General Manager, Queensland and Northern Territory for IBM. IBM are the sponsors of tonight's uh, uh, presentation. So without any further ado, Bob, uh, please make Bob feel very welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if you realise how hard you made Andrew work then to get you away from the bar. Now, I'm not sure if that's a time of year thing or a finance sector thing, but he was, uh, you had to go for, what, 10 minutes there, wasn't it? Yeah, I think he gave half his presentation. I think David was even up for a moment there. And, uh, but, uh, but we'll start again. Now we have all your, your attention. IBM's delighted to be involved in today's event. We, we have sponsored uh, several of the ABNF functions through the year. We found uh, from audience feedback that the audience has found the sessions interesting, informative, and really importantly, provocative. So I think we'll take that as an invitation for David, our keynote, to provoke us into new ways of thinking about the banking sector. Um, it is that time of year, David, I think, where you can be a bit, uh, a bit loose, perhaps, can I say that? Um, we're, we're getting towards the end of the year, so we're really looking forward to hearing uh, your ideas, your experiences, and, uh, and learning from those. Suncorp will be well known to all of you, of course, but a few stats. Um, I'm sure you know they are the fifth largest banking organisation uh, in Australia, part of the Suncorp Group, which in itself is uh, an ASX 25 listed organisation, and, and equally you would all know operates some of the country's most respected finance sector brands, uh, AME, GIO, Shannon's, etc., uh, and of course Suncorp Bank. A little bit about David, um, cut his teeth, is that the right way to say it, in the early days uh, within the Westpac organisation, I understand for some 14 years, uh, worked his way up the, uh, the organisation in both New South Wales and Queensland, uh, joined the Suncorp organisation and has held senior roles within the group strategy function, uh, as well as the retail, uh, the retail bank function. Finally given, or finally hard earned, the keys to the castle, I think, as chief executive of Suncorp Bank at a very interesting time, uh, late 2008. And you may touch on, uh, on what, that, what happened next and, uh, in terms of what happened to the banking sector in, that, uh, that, in a very uh, interesting time since then. I'm pleased to say he survived and thrived in the role of CEO of Suncorp Bank, and I'm delighted to, uh, to ask you to join me to welcome him to the, uh, the podium right now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob, and uh, I'm not sure that I'll be able to live up to that uh, high, uh, high introduction, but I'll, I'll see how I, how I go. It's uh, great to, uh, to see a number of uh, friends and former colleagues here tonight, so uh, uh, hopefully I get a chance to chat to a number of you uh, after the event. But uh, first, I'd just like to thank uh, ABNF, uh, King & Wood Mallisons, uh, Randstad for hosting tonight's event, and of course uh, to IBM, our uh, event sponsors. Uh, tonight, as, uh, as, as mentioned before, I'd, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the hotly debated topic of competition uh, within the banking industry and certainly how smaller players like Suncorp and, and many of, of you others uh, from other organisations here tonight can compete effectively and provide the necessary tension within the industry that we truly require. And this is notwithstanding the, the highly concentrated market that we're in today, where around 80% of the market is controlled by the four major banks, uh, which is up from about 52% uh, back in 2007. Uh, this, together with an environment uh, we face with ongoing economic, uh, regulatory, funding and political headwinds. And if you speak about some of these headwinds, uh, we seem to be ever living through the global financial crisis that, that does never end. And so if it's not Greece or one of our Euro the EU neighbours lurching from one drama to the next, it's the US hurtling towards their, their fiscal cliff after mopping up after Hurricane Sandy. But certainly relative to peers around the world, Australia is a standout economic performer, supported by a very strong financial services sector and demand from resources, from, particularly from Asia. But certainly there's no room for complacency. We're certainly at a crossroads. The opportunity really does exist now to create economic certainty, and this includes a very robust strategy and policy around industry 
diversification and importantly the promotion of a competitive multi-tiered banking sector. Australia's reliance on the mining and resources industry, which certainly is coming off its peak, is a challenge for policymakers and businesses alike looking to address these structural changes. It's a challenge for these people and certainly when you look at SMEs and exporters, many of which are customers of ours, continuing to struggle with the strength of the Australian dollar and the impact most evident here in Queensland from the highly patchwork economy is very evident. Obviously there's enormous wealth being driven by resources and this is in contrast to the more moderately paced growth that we're seeing in other industries, whether it be agriculture, construction, manufacturing, tourism or services. And this has caused certainly a dislocation whether you look at property and rental prices, uh, confidence and wages when looking at by region or different employment sectors. So it really is, does require a unified effort by both government and business to build a balanced and more diverse industry base involving the key sectors I just mentioned. These need to be developed in conjunction and whilst maintaining the strong position that we have in, in resources. I do think that the success and sustainability of our economy more broadly uh, really does depend on it. However, I turn to the banking industry specifically in the current climate. Obviously we're looking at uh, ongoing volatility as mentioned before, both on a global and a domestic basis. This continues to weigh very heavily on consumers and businesses alike. So trends to deleverage and hoard savings uh, in both deposits continue at record levels and I think for the first time since the 1980s household saving rates are at around 10%. In this environment banking will see a continuation of a slow growth environment driven by reduced demand for credit and increased cost of funding, deposits and capital. And for the non-major banks, in particular the pressure of the current climate combined with the changes of the GFC brought about to the competitive landscape continues to be significant. We're perhaps not seeing the same consolidation at a bank level that we saw in the immediate wake of the GFC, but there continues to be consolidation in the mutual sector and notably in the aggregation space. Despite plenty of brands in the aggregator market, the ownership of these brands is becoming increasingly more concentrated in the hands of major banks. This impacts the competitive landscape and is potentially a detriment to consumers who perceive brokers to be genuinely independent. This has the potential for, to force fur, further mergers in this sector and certainly impede competition. If we turn to the cost and burden of funding and regulation, this also continues to create an uneven playing field for banks. It's got a significant impact on our ability for the non-majors to compete and it needs to be dealt with as a priority. Regulatory reform has become something of a norm in the banking industry and we're likely to see this continue. I should stop for a minute and recognise that I, I do believe that the regulators did do a fantastic job during the GFC to, to get the industry through that. Uh, but with more than 20 inquiries since that time into the banking sector over recent years, none of them have really brought about any meaningful or real change uh, required to deliver a, a truly sustainable, diverse and competitive marketplace. The disproportionate cost burden of regulation cannot be underestimated either. Smaller players are at a significant disadvantage to the majors when you look at this on a per customer basis. Access to funding and securitisation also remains a challenge for non-majors and a fundamental impediment for the ability of that sector to compete and grow. Despite an easing in wholesale funding markets in recent months and quality assets sitting in many of their portfolios, smaller banks are at a significant disadvantage without the, the, the higher credit ratings that the major banks have. Likewise, the heavy reliance upon expensive retail deposits to fund their books only adds to this problem. So in terms of levelling the playing fields for banks of all sizes, I think it's essential that we step up our efforts in lobbying, gov lobbying government and regulators to reform uh, delivering competition in banking for the benefit of our consumers and small businesses. We need a manageable and constructive regulatory program and this is essential including measures that provide practical assistance which may include broader access to markets and tools such as securitisation, covered bonds and senior unsecured funding, super fund pools via fixed interest markets, tax incentives on savings that are material and sustained to encourage deposits and regulatory capital weightings against mortgage books of smaller banks comparable with those of the major banks. As a start to any meaningful reform though, we need a strong and constructive debate. 
This needs to focus on policy rather than personality and any spheres of politics, regardless of any upcoming election or timing or outcome. And while the government and regulators certainly do have a serious role to play in improving competition and forming this discussion, it's also up to us within the industry to prove the value of the regional or smaller bank offerings that we provide to customers. And this needs to be delivered through constant innovation, risk management improvements and sticking with the business that we know and do best. Productivity by our sector will be driven by innovation and simplification and the ability to adapt quickly to this changing environment. And it's important because this will be a game changer and includes everything from payment systems uh, to customer service and fulfilment through digital channels. At Suncorp, developing our online and mobile channels is certainly a priority and we're using technology to provide more product and services and choice to our customers and doing this through simplifying our IT architecture to make sure that our systems and processes become more effective and user friendly. Consistent with others, uh, we've seen certainly very strong growth in our mobile channel with over 120% growth in the last 12 months, with the mobile banking channel now accounting for nearly half of all of our internet banking activity. All players must continue to innovate uh, to build a more competitive landscape. Those who don't will surely be left behind in this digital wage. Particularly if we look at some of the non-bank players that are now entering the market with some aggression, including PayPal, Google, Amazon, who look to take advantage of this increasingly digital marketplace they operate in and threaten to capture both market share and control of our customers. And this playing field is by no means what we'd call level. From a Suncorp perspective, we believe we're competing strongly and remaining hot on the heels of the major banks. And from our perspective, there's a number of facets to being able to do this. And uh, we heard a little bit about the GFC, and I won't dwell on these GFC measures for long, but it is important to note that a number of the tough decisions and actions that we took as a result as of the immediate aftermath of this crisis have really set us up well to take advantage of the current marketplace and how we're positioned today. Suncorp, I think, is landed in a fairly unique position within the industry, the, sec the leader of the second tier banking sector, with credit rating advantages over our regional and smaller bank peers. As mentioned, we are a core part of a top ASX20 listed Suncorp group, and we're able to swiftly adapt to some of these changing market conditions, given the support of our a credit rating, which provides us scale, pricing and capacity benefits, funding capabilities that do provide us the opportunity as a credible alternative to the major banks and facilitate growth. And I think this is best evidenced by our recent issuances this year of two covered bonds, uh, the first of a non-major bank in Australia, which really does highlight our ability to tap this market. Uh, and it's uh, probably worth mentioning that uh, I think as of today, the, the, the price of our most rate recent issuance is yet to be beaten by any of the major banks. In addition to this capability as being part of the group, we do have access to over 9 million customers as part of the Suncorp group. Uh, it also brings us cost benefits and scale and the ability to leverage a complete banking, insurance and wealth management solution and offering to our customers. The ability to implement sophisticated technology as we continue to adapt to a generation of customers who demand access at all hours and through a multitude of different devices. However, in doing this and dealing with this complexity, it's also important that to note the value of keeping it simple, despite operating in this environment. At Suncorp, we think sticking to the basics, offering customers a simple and attractive product suite as they look for alternatives to the majors is important. This focus on simplicity means focusing on fewer things, but making sure that we do them as well as we can. It also means having very well-defined risk settings and a culture, and not being seduced by short-termism or opportunities before these risk settings or our capabilities. So against this backdrop and the growing negative sentiment that we're seeing against the major banks and their regional brand facades, we are slowly but surely seeing customers switch to smaller competitors, backed by the better service that we provide. So I do think that Australia's non-majors remain critically important in, fo in forcing the big four to be competitive, whether it be on service, price, policy or broker commissions. Banks are not going to win business or maintain a sustainable offering on price alone, nor on customer service, or the variety or sophistication of products that, that are offered the latest marketing campaign, or how savvy their latest mobile app is. Indeed, it is a combination of factors that is the key to success, and getting this mix right 
we're fo is what we're certainly focused on at Suncorp. It's our overall offering and the way in which we deliver it that's important to the majority of our customers. And whilst I think we have got a way to go, we've certainly got the scope to expand and capture further growth that we're already seeing from our current 3% national market share without the funding risk or deposit tasks that many of the major banks have. So just in summary, I thought I'd leave you with a few points uh, and, and comments about the outlook. So despite the ongoing global economic and market volatility, we're seeing this subdued confidence and a number of structural challenges that we need to deal with. I do remain optimistic though about Australia and certainly indeed Queensland should policymakers take, take the necessary steps now to plan the future. We continue to live in a period of low growth and fierce competition, particularly for deposits, and this is unlikely to subside anytime soon. So this is the new normal that we need to adopt, to, adopt for now. And for the banking sector, there is certainly some way to go in developing an even playing field, but Australia does have the capacity to build a more sustainable and competitive financial system. Trying to balance the trust factor and the, and the safety factor of the financial system against the need for competition is not easy, but certainly is essential. A banking system where competition continues to be stifled will have significant implications for economic growth, for consumers, as well as the broader reputation and sustainability of our entire industry. This is the challenge that politicians, policymakers and businesses certainly now face, and having a solid, stable and sustainable multi-tiered banking system in my view is absolutely critical to the future competition and health of the industry in Australia. So championing this by offering a, a genuine alternative to the major banks is a role that we certainly take seriously at Suncorp and, it's, and we're proud to be in a position to help lead the non-bank major bank sector in doing this. Thanks very much and happy to take some questions. David, I'm impressed with how much you managed to get through there in about 20 minutes. You've really captured, I think, the, uh, the essence of our agenda in the magazine and what we've been doing with the events for the whole year. So well done on that. I've got a few questions myself. I won't go straight into my questions because I'd like you to put your hand up now and, uh, and ask the first question of David before I do. I always get in first and I don't like doing that. So there's a question right here. It's a bit like an auction really, isn't it? <laughs> Um, my question is, how confident are you of getting dialogue with the regulator about changing um, the playing field? I think it's a complex task because the, the mandates for the different stakeholders that we need to engage with are quite, are quite different. So the, uh, the, the regulator's objective is stability and, and safety of the system, which um, doesn't necessarily coexist with, with, with competitive environments, uh, particularly on the backdrop of the, the GFC. But uh, it, it's actually the balance, I think, between uh, government, um, broader policy makers such as Treasury and, and the regulators that we need to influence because um, uh, for the broader good of the economy and so forth. But uh, regulators alone won't, won't get us there um, given, given the mandate. It's an important point you make. We've got four major regulators that regulate the banking system, mm. uh, APRA, ASIC, the Reserve Bank, and uh, the ACCC. And mm. As far as I'm concerned, only one of them is really <clears throat> even mandated to, to, uh, to try and pr promote competition, and you would argue that they probably haven't done that as well as maybe they could have. So it's actually not in the regulator's interest mm. to promote uh, competition. And to be honest, I'm not sure that it's really within the politicians' interest to that much, is it? It's something they like to talk about, but I'm not seeing a lot of action in that front, are they? Well, I think to really drive it, and, and this is not just for smaller players, but also for the broader industry, there, there needs to be some innovation and some significant structural change to funding markets, which at the end of the day is, is the, the fuel for competition and, and sustainability of the industry. And uh, uh, I mentioned deposit savings in, the, in, uh, in, in one of the comments there, and we saw the sort of token token gesture as part of the, uh, the, the tax changes, which, which lasted about six months and, and then were essentially unwound. So we, we need to get a lot more serious in terms of um, doing that because as soon as, as demand for credit uh, or the opportunity with, for increased credit growth uh, presents itself, uh, Australia won't be able to fund itself, and which will have much more dire consequences. So. In saying that, to be fair, the AFM program has been quite successful in, in helping liquidity and supporting the, the markets when they were particularly through those difficult times. Yeah, I think a number of the, me the measures like that are, uh, have been useful in supporting various parts of the sector um, from a, 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 a stability perspective, but not a growth perspective. Um, We're at the next stage now, aren't we? Where really right. we need to see a lot more growth. Mm -hmm. uh, more questions from the floor? I know we've got some questions because I was talking to a lot of people earlier and they've got some really good questions. Now you've got to put your hand up. David, you uh, mentioned the importance of technology a few times in your, your speech and 
PayPal is now quite a mature competitor to the traditional banking. Uh, what, what's Suncor's view on some of the new emergent like peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is certainly growing in Europe and also America? And uh, also things like Kickstarter that are starting to look at different ways of doing business finance. Yeah, I, I think um, at a really interesting place, and, and I'm not sure how long this will take to to evolve. But um, I think in terms of the banking sector, there's, there's a lot of sort of one-off initiatives taking place in that sort of space at the moment. But the industry itself, I think, will converge in the next sort of five years into a sort of industry standard or, or utility. But I think the biggest threat for, for our industry is players like PayPal or Google and so forth that have got enormous uh, brand strength, uh, enormous capacity and capability, uh, and are certainly developing into a number of the, the, uh, the these areas. And if you look at the fundamental role of what a, what a bank is, it's to, to move money between someone that has it to someone that doesn't have it. And uh, um, they're pretty well placed to do that if they can uh, you know, move away from some of the traditional paradigms around cash, currency, etc. So uh, I think long term, they're, they're the biggest threat to, 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 to uh, the, the sector generally uh, for the mass consumer proposition. But um, in, in saying that as well, I think if, if it does evolve that way, there'll be opportunities open up for smaller players uh, to, to provide nice solutions, whether it be to segments or, or propositions and so forth that um, uh, smaller players will be in a better position to do than, than the majors because they haven't got as much to, much to lose. So. It's interesting, um, I get the chance to sit down with the CEOs of the big four banks as well and talk to David. The, the question I ask in those t sessions, and I know Angela, you were, you've been there for, um, from Randstad in some of those sessions, is what keeps you awake at night? And the one topic that they always consistently come up with is that payment space and the, the likelihood of a Google or a PayPal or a Motorola or a Samsung coming into the payment space and dominating. I think there's a, a serious regulatory issue around that one. I know the regulators have got something to say on that one, but that is one area where the banks, if they don't move efficiently and quickly through technology, have the potential to lose a lot of customer um, service capability and therefore trust in that in that core uh, space, which is payments. So um, mm. a, an important topic. A question over here. David Mick O'Donnell, PwC. This being a leaders lecture series, can you comment, since you've been um, in charge um, at the bank, can you reflect on what's been your, your most challenging decision that you've had to make as a leader and maybe talk a little about the process that you went through to come to a landing on what that was? Um, I guess probably um, uh, probably a couple of areas. Certainly, um, uh, I think Rob mentioned about the, the GFC and we certainly had to make some very difficult decisions uh, back at the end of 08 and early 09 on, on two fronts. One in terms of um, you know, customer segments and parts of the business that we would no longer operate in and, and uh, that, that involves some fairly difficult discussions with staff as well as uh, customers of, obviously around, around that sort of, a, sort of approach. Um, and uh, that, uh, that that was quite difficult, uh, and uh, the flow and implications of that in terms of uh, people's jobs and, and all that sort of thing is, is obviously difficult. And you know, strategically, essentially um, l limiting your scope then for a period of time around the around the business, which you, you can't just chime in and then chime out of again um, quickly uh, in, in in terms of that uh, that that piece. Um, so that that probably been the most challenging or difficult in the in the most recent years. So. Questions from the floor? I've got a couple, but um, any more questions from the floor? David, you've got a, a, six, a, a bank assurance model uh, uh, in Suncorp. You've got a very strong insurance part of the business. You've got funds management and you've got banking. To my mind, that's the future, and that is where, if you can get those all those areas working well for your customers, you're going to have a customer for a long time. What are some of the more cultural issues that you've got to deal with when putting banking together with funds management with insurance? Because as I work across those industry sectors, I see a lot of differences in the, the background of people that are in insurance to the background of the people that are in banking and the background of the people in funds management. Is that a significant issue? Is there cultural issues about getting uh, a business to work harmoniously across all those three sectors? How's it going at Suncorp? Yeah, no, I think first, first I'd say we certainly don't think of it as a, as a bank assurance model. We, we, the important part of our model is that we have distinct lines of, lines of business that uh, are accountable for delivering outcomes. And uh, in our case, if it makes sense then to, to work with other customer bases or other brands or, or other products to, to enhance the outcomes we need to deliver, then um, then uh, that's the focus that we, we have. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of examples. I think culturally it works very well at, at, at Suncorp. Uh, we, we don't have any um, 
uh, wooden dollars, as, as, as we describe them, uh, sort of falsifying relationships or, or outcomes. It is very much driven about um, how can we help each other get uh, get particular uh, particular outcomes, uh, and that works very well in, in a number of cases. Uh, from our perspective, in the in the bank, uh, we uh, we we sell about 30% um, of the total SunCorp insurance uh, policy income uh, is through our branch channels. Uh, we, we renew about 45% uh, through that channel as well. And uh, with the floods last year here in, in Brisbane, we had about 70% of our customers had uh, Suncorp insurance uh, that obviously protected them in a, in a very difficult situation. Uh, our life we gave business, you some awards for that, by the way, yeah. this year. Yeah. Uh, our life business is uh, a great example, actually, of um, how this works it, in that uh, they, they've created a, a call centre that sits within our insurance, general insurance call centre, and, and they sell life insurance to a variety of our general insurance brands um, through a through a, a call process uh, where customers are talking about general insurance and they, they, they ask if they'd like to talk about life insurance and it's, it's quite a seamless and easy process and uh, you know a low acquisition cost process because it's already uh, and, uh, you know we get 10 million calls um, through through those call centers so it's a it's a it's an easy uh, acquisition channel for us um, but certainly culturally it's a, a, a good uh, a, a good uh, executive team from the different lines of business that work well together um, for and from an incentive point of view, which I think um, does make uh, it a little bit easier, that yeah. 60, over 60% of our uh, the leadership team's um, remuneration is, is on the group collective result, not uh, not our own individual outcomes. So. I know that's not the case in some of the other major mm -hmm. banks, so, mm -hmm. um, so well done on that. Any more questions? I've got a couple more questions, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't want to hog the, the microphone. Can you put your hands in the air if you've uh, got a question for David? David, you mentioned, and, and all of the CEOs, as I said when lunching with them, unprompted mention that there's going to be an inquiry, a major inquiry in banking, another yep. Wallace, a Wallace mm -hmm. part two. Um, and you, you mentioned that in your, your presentation. What do you think are some of the key things that maybe should be in that terms of reference? From what perspective, from what angle should the politicians be looking to uh, an inquiry like that? Because they are, mate, they are large, they are timely, they're mm -hmm. expensive and they're far reaching and they have significant implications. I'd like to see something positive, but what do you think you would be suggesting to politicians if you had the chance to brief them? Yeah, well, obviously we talk uh, in the in the ABA particularly around what brief we'd like for that activity, and and uh, I think it's very important because, as I mentioned, there's probably been 20 inquiries, and and really not much has come out of them the last uh, five years or so. Uh, so I think the important part out of this one, which has certainly been raised in some of the other inquiries, is that for the economic health of the country, having a sustainable, profitable. Uh, and growing banking system is is necessary to underpin the growth in the in the broader economy. So if there's no there's no credit provision, there's no credit growth, and if there's no credit growth, there's no economic growth. So we need to really fix this funding issue that uh, that that underpins the strength of the whole industry, and and that requires us to do something different. And I think in doing that, we do need to define what the regulators, what the the policymakers, the government, uh, business. Uh, want and need as, as a sustainable system and, and, and in our view having a multi-tiered banking system is, is absolutely necessary to, to underpin that, that, that uh, provides a, a range of alternatives, uh, a range of propositions uh, for uh, different uh, customers as well as investors. So we, we think that would be the ideal outcome but we'll need a lot of work particularly on uh, how to make that multi-tiered system sustainable. Because so. at the moment it really is very much slanted towards those big four. We've got a current situation where we've got the deposit term deposit market is dominating uh, and uh, it's actually crowding out the fixed income market here in Australia. I know the RMBS sector is recovering, which is nice to see. I'm mm. sure you're very happy about mm. that. Uh, but currently we've got the, the term deposit market, which is great for people who are saving, but if you're wanting to be active in the fixed income market, mm. most of your money is going to go into term deposits. It doesn't exactly help prompt a corporate bond market, which has been talked about mm. here in Australia. It does make it hard for everyone else that's not a big four bank. Mm. To, uh, to receive deposits, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think the two big parts of that is, is one is making it more attractive to grow the savings pool, whether that be through deposits and tax incentives or opening up the fixed income market, which uh, by international standards, uh, our proportion out of our super funds is probably half what the, 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 the world average is for, for fixed income. So I, I think those two measures are two really necessary to help. And it's not just about the smaller players, actually, the, 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 the people that uh, have... So if you look at ourselves or... Or, or Bendigo, our ratio of deposits to, to, to lending is, is, is much higher than the, the, the major banks. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, given our credit rating, we've got access to all the same funding markets that the majors have, so uh, we're probably in quite a positive and unique position. But mm. um, you know, if, if, if lending growth starts creeping up to double digits, then 
no one will be able to use deposits to fund that growth. It, it has to come from somewhere. And if, if Europe's still in a mess and, and other solutions, um, we, we need to fund it from somewhere. So. Okay, time for one or two more questions. Have we got any more from the floor? Any more from the floor? We've got around here, I'm looking at Tim Hughes, who's your treasurer. Tim, you got any questions for the boss? No? no none over there? Okay. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank David for, uh, for giving us his time and, uh, and insights this evening at the Leaders Lecture Series. And if you look at the list confirmed for 2012, you'll also, 2013, you'll also see David has already confirmed for this time next year. So maybe the title of your presence next year could be One Year On, How Did We Go With The Inquiry? Or something to that, to that effect. But I won't give you the title for yeah, hopefully your presentation. Have by then, so. hey, well, <laughs> I'm not hopeful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to, uh, to ask you to put your hands together for David for his uh, genuinely very good insights in, in 20 minutes. I thought that was fantastic. Please put your hands together for David. And I've got one or two more um, official duties to do before we wrap that up. I'd actually like to uh, invite now our hosts for this evening, Berkeley Cox from, as a partner with King of Wood Mallisons, to, do, to have the closing remarks. Fantastic premises here, Berkeley. Great evening that you've put on. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Berkeley Cox. Yeah, good evening. Look, thanks everybody for taking the time out to come along tonight. It's a busy time of year in the sort of silly party season, um, so it's great to see such a large turnout here. Thanks, uh, Andrew, for, for giving us the opportunity to, to put on tonight. Obviously, we're very pleased to be associated with ABNF and have the opportunity to, to uh, sponsor events like this. Um, thank you, David. You know, very insightful words. Um, you know, we, we, we concur with a lot of the things you said, particularly around regulation, which we see every day. There's a lot of short-termism in what we see. There's a lot of knee-jerk reaction to sort of out-of-cycle events. And, and, and a lot of uh, in what we see is, is uncertainty, which, which creates difficulties for people trying to sort of invest and, and get on with things. And we see that in areas like you know, consumer credit, where we think the pendulum sort of swung a little bit too far in favour of the, of the consumers, things like unfair terms, which are quite difficult to, to interpret from a, from a certainty perspective. And on the, on the regulatory capital side, we see some of the rules coming out of APRA, which you know, are quite cumbersome and difficult to interpret and, and change quite regularly. And when banks are trying to organise their funding and, and, and get things moving to, to invest, it's, it's quite challenging when they're dealing with the moving goalposts all the time. It's, it's, it's obviously continues to be a sort of delicate environment out there, and, and we, we see it every day. Everybody in the room here is sort of no doubt affected by the continued global deleveraging process and the continued wave of regulatory reform that, that we've seen. As soon as we sort of begin to hope that we're, we're through the worst of it or that maybe we've developed uh, immunity to the, to the anxiety, something sort of snaps and, and hits us again. So congratulations, everybody, for surviving uh, 2012, another, another uh, interesting year. Good luck in, in, in surviving, uh, in surviving uh, 2013. We were very fortunate to, to assist the bank on the establishment of their, of their covered bond program and to give a little bit more depth and context in, into what uh, that David referred to. Um, one of the major banks uh, issued at, at the very start of the year at, at, at 170, uh, 175, I think, wasn't it, Tim, over swaps. Um, the, the, the deal that David referred to back in September was 90 over swaps. So uh, it, is, it is great to see an organisation that that is nimble, and, I, and I, I, it, what, what David said does resonate with me and what I see in, in the clients that we act for. They are nimble and fast, and they can, they can uh, tap into opportunities very effectively and very quickly. So there is a real benefit to simplicity in, in, in what we see in, in organisations like Suncorp and their ability to compete with, with the bigger guys. So congratulations, David. Um, fantastic uh, in, in, take, in, in what you've done in taking the bank to, to, to where it is. Please uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, the drinks will be on for a little while longer. So, uh, again, thanks very much for coming along. Enjoy the rest of the night and, and uh, good luck with the, uh, with the festive season and uh, have a great time. Thank you, Berkeley. <laughs> now, I've got one more very important task to do, and that's give away that bottle of champagne over there. So what I'm going to ask David to do is, um, without, uh, without looking, is... Uh, Here we go. You want me to tape it on the top of it? <laughs> All right, now let me, let me put, put it all up here. Now reach in there, and uh, I know you're not looking. There we go. And we have got a card. And it, uh, would it be from one of your competitors? It would be, so I'm going to put it back. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And it's from Heritage Bag, Wayne Langford. You've just picked up, on behalf of Randstad, a lovely bottle of Bollinger, one of my favourite drops. So, Wayne, would you please make your way up here and accept that on behalf of...